can I say like one to 10? Cause it could be either end of the spectrum. He goes out and they win eight this year. It's a 10. He goes out, they win 10 this year. It's a one. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. Today is July 29th. It's Friday. It's the final show of July. So we appreciate you being with us from wherever it is you're coming to us from. Whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on ESPN YouTube channel, we really appreciate you being with us. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps us out. It helps the show out. And we look forward to our interactions with you through the comments and the concerns. We're, of course, going to tailor the show to your needs and desires. So we look forward to our interactions and helping making us better. Thanks so much. I'm Greg McElroy, along with my co-host and my good friend, Mark Kubiak. We have a great game plan in store for you today as we're going to dive into the Pac-12. Like I said, it's the final show of talking season as Pac-12 Media Days will start and finish here today on Friday, July 29th. I also want to get into it. It's the first year head coach's pressure meter. Who's under the most pressure to perform in year number one? So a lot that we need to get to. So let's kick it off with let's talk about it. The Pac-12 has been oh so close the last couple of years when it comes to getting a team into the college football playoff. It just hasn't materialized. But maybe this year, maybe this is it, 2022, when they finally reemerge with a legitimate contender. We're going to find out rather quickly because week number one is going to tell us just about all we need to know. The favorites in the Pac-12 North, they're the Oregon Ducks. They play the defending national champions in Atlanta. That'll be a doozy. That'll be a tough one. And even if they aren't successful in that one, we have seen situations in the past where teams have lost early only to generate enough goodwill by season's end to get back in the mix when it comes to the college football conversation. It doesn't get much easier when you look to the favorites in the Pac-12 South. That'd be the Utah Utes. They travel to Gainesville, Florida. There in week number one, Billy Napier making his debut as the head coach of the Florida Gators. That'll be a tough one as well. So when you look at both matchups, we could find out rather quickly when it comes to the Pac-12's candidacy for the college football playoff. Let's dive into some of the rosters and some of the things that we like coming back here this season. Let's start with Oregon. It's going to look a little different. Obviously, Dan Lanning now going to be the head coach for the Oregon Ducks. Expect him to bring a physical tough approach and trying to build off what Mario Cristobal already established. When you actually watch them, they're actually not that far away. They had some bad performances last year, but it seemed like their kryptonite was the Utah Utes. For whatever reason, against Utah, at the end of the half in both games against the Utes, they just completely shot themselves in the foot, killing any chance of creating momentum. Utah carried that momentum through into the second half, and both games got sideways rather quickly there in the second half. However, Bo Nix now transfers up from Auburn. He has been with Kenny Dillingham. He's the offensive coordinator. He's been with him in the past with some decent results. Kenny Dillingham loves to utilize that up-tempo system. He comes from the Mike Norvell coaching tree. He played, or he didn't play, but he coached at Memphis with Mike Norvell and executed Pretty efficient offense in just about every stop that he's had. Bo Nix does bring back a decent supporting cast of talent. Granted, they will have to replace Travis Dye. That will be a difficult piece to replace because of what he meant to that team, not just as far as running the football downhill, but also what he contributed in the passing game. They have some good weapons. They recruited really well. But ultimately, the reason why I feel so good about Oregon is because I have so many question marks on all the other teams in the Pac-12 North. Right now, I don't feel very good about any other team eclipsing the seven-win plateau. You look at what Oregon State did last year. Love what Jonathan Smith did, bring back some good pieces, but have to also replace a couple key pieces along the line of scrimmage, which is really where that team made their hay last year. They'll be able to run the football. You know that they're going to be well coached, but is there enough to be able to put together consistent performance week in and week out, enough to the point where they could actually win the division? I have a difficult time forecasting a leap like that. Washington, very disappointing season last year. You got to hope they'll be better, but are they going to be good enough to the point where they can really compete? Probably not. I don't like Washington State this year as much, even though I think their quarterback transfer has a real chance, a real chance to have a very special season. Incarnate Ward transfer. So we'll see what happens 
with Washington State. I think they have a chance to be dangerous. Of course, Pullman's always a little bit tricky place to go. But really, I think their success, like seasons past with Washington State, it kind of hinges on quarterback play. So hopefully Cameron Ward can provide some stability at that position. Does have some pieces around him, especially a wide receiver that they'll be able to build with. But like I said about the aforementioned teams, is there enough to really close the gap with the Oregon Ducks? My answer at this point is definitely no. And Stanford at this point last year, disappointment. They have a good recruiting class, but probably going to be relying a little bit too much on youth to be able to really be a significant threat in the Pac-12 North. So Basically, by a process of elimination, we end up with the Oregon Ducks. As far as the Pac-12 South is concerned, it's much more difficult to prognosticate. I think Utah is the team to beat. Be hard-pressed not to consider them the team to beat, given how they played last year, when finally figuring out and settling on who their quarterback of the future was going to be. Cameron Rising to me, Cam Rising, Cameron Rising, whatever you want to call him, that dude is electric. The guy he reminds me of is Tony Romo, actually. He just makes plays. It might not always be pretty. It might not always be perfectly executed. But if it needs to happen, he, for whatever reason, always finds a way. He's going to be surrounded by a really solid cast. They bring back three of their top four rushers. They bring back four of their top five pass catchers. Britton Covey's the only one they'll miss, and they will miss him. Do not, don't disregard that absence. He was obviously their leader as far as receptions were concerned just last year and was a real dependable player there on the perimeter for the Utah Utes. But where does Utah always make their hay? It's in the front seven defensively. They'll be able to get to the passer. They'll be able to create opportunities by forcing turnovers. And I think they'll do a really good job of getting off the field on third down, which they've done traditionally fairly well over the course of Kyle Whittingham's future. They are the top dog, but man, does it feel like the gap has closed. With Lincoln Riley's arrival there at USC, it feels like they are poised to at least become a contender. Will they do it this year? I have a difficult time anticipating that. Now, don't get me wrong. We've seen average USC teams beat really good Utah teams in the past because of their personnel at the on the perimeter at wide receiver. I'm not sure that's going to be the case this year. I think Caleb Williams has a chance to be an all Pac-12 performer. I'd be surprised if he wasn't in the Heisman mix at season's end, based on the projections that a lot of people have made for him, I align myself with those projections as well. I think he's got great God-given ability and has a really solid supporting cast of weapons around him. We know they have weapons. We know they have skill. But what did the Trojans really need? They need front seven personnel on the defensive side of the football. That group, for the most part, has been very hit or miss. They've had some stars. And Clay Helton had some stars along the line of scrimmage defensively, but they have seldom had depth. Need more depth, need more big bodies, need more athleticism on the edges for me to really consider this defense to be a true game changer. They'll get into some shootouts and they'll score some points and they'll be fun to watch. But do they have enough to be able to overtake Utah? I think it's a year, maybe two years away before USC really gets into the prominent picture when it comes to the Pac-12 championship game. Maybe even at that point, maybe the Big Ten championship game. I don't know when their arrival is. ETA is TBD, I suppose. But we'll discuss that at a later date. Another team that I really like, and I think we should all probably be taking notice of what's going on there in Westwood. UCLA, I think, developed an identity last year as a team that wants to establish the line of scrimmage, create a lot of complex run looks, and make it very difficult on opposing defenses. Look, when you play UCLA, do not let the powder blue uniforms confuse you. This team wants to punch you in the face. That's who they are. They're physical. They're tough. They understand who they are. They understand what their strengths are. They also have a good grasp of what their weaknesses are. And they do the best they can to avoid putting DTR, Dorian thompson Robson, their quarterback, in situations where he's uncomfortable. Look, it's year four, year five, whatever it is for DTR. It's time for him to take the next step as a consistent passer. We know what he can do with his legs. We know that he's going to be able to lean on Zach Charbonnet at running back who returns after what was a tremendous season where he led the Bruins in rushing. I believe he had almost 1,300 yards, 1,100 yards, whatever it was. The guy had big numbers running the football, and he's going to get ample opportunities to do that again. DTR was third on the team in rushing. He's going to continue to have to be present 
there in the run game that really likes to cut the field in half. One side of the line of scrimmage might be running one play. One side of the line of scrimmage might be running a different play. It's up to you as a defense to try to diagnose it, and I'm not sure how you do it. I think Chip Kelly is one of the very best when it comes to comprising schemes and making it difficult on the opposition. I think UCLA, when you look at things, they are a real threat in the Pac-12 South, but do they have enough balance offensively to really overtake a team with steady quarterback play that doesn't often beat themselves and is good in all three phases in Utah. I have a difficult time anticipating that as far as the bottom half of the PAC 12 South, I don't see any contenders. I think Arizona state will take a fairly significant step back. They've had talent recent years, but it feels like this year with so many departures, it's going to be difficult for them to replicate that success. I think Arizona will be improved under Jed fish year number two, but probably not good enough to threaten. And then finally, Colorado. Who knows what to make of Colorado at this point, but they are distant when it comes to the consideration at the top of the Pac-12 South. All right, time to do an annual favorite. At this point, start to evaluate all the first-year head coaches that are taking over new gigs. And I'll tell you what, some of them are stepping in to the pressure cooker, which is why we have come up with such a creative term for this segment as known now and forever moving forward as the pressure meter. On a scale of 1 to 10, we'll assess the current situation for each first-year head coach, Coop. So let's kick it off. Where are we going? We're going to start in the SEC because if you're going to start in a pressure conference, you got to start <laughs> in a pressure program. Brian Kelly at LSU on the pressure meter, 10 being the most pressure, 1 being very little. Where does Brian Kelly rank? Well, obviously, a 10-year contract will – cool the seat just a little bit he's obviously not in jeopardy of losing his job but if you think there aren't insane expectations at LSU a program just three years removed from a national championship I think Brian Kelly stepping into a situation where his pressure meter is at nine out of ten now hang on a second let me hear me out part of the reason why I think people anticipate this being a winning marriage is you look at what Brian Kelly did at a place that a lot of people said was going to be impossible to do. He built a consistent winner at Notre Dame in an era where people thought it couldn't be done. You look at programs like Nebraska, uh, programs that have had long storied historical success, Georgia Tech, Colorado, programs with really proud history have struggled to remain relevant in the modern era. And it was looking like there for a minute, like Notre Dame was kind of starting to head down the same path. Well, what did Brian Kelly do? He just won 10 games in six of the last seven seasons. And he got Notre Dame to the playoff on multiple different occasions. So what's the next step for him as a head coach? Well, if you ain't first, you're last, baby. It's Ricky Bobby. So if he doesn't win a national championship, people will look at his tenure as a legitimate failure. Is that fair? Probably not. But at LSU, his last three predecessors, Nick Saban, Ed Ogeron, and of course, Les Miles, all three won national championships. All three were, well, not all three. Nick Saban wasn't removed, but Les Miles was ultimately fired after subpar performance and a refusal to change. And Ed Ogeron was fired just a couple years after winning the national championship. So nine out of 10 feels appropriate given what the expectations are and what I guess people will view as a failed tenure for Brian Kelly in Baton Rouge. Solid Ricky Bobby reference in there, by the way. Uh, <laughs> moving on, staying in the SEC, Billy Napier in Florida. What's his pressure at? Well, at this point, and I think it's, it's funny because we treat LSU like they are so close to doing something really remarkable, really close to doing something special. Well, we kind of have short-sighted memory when it comes to Florida because last time I checked in 2020, they were about the only team that gave Alabama fits, and they did so in the SEC championship game. Now, it wasn't enough. Obviously, Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts and, and that really talented Kadarius Toney, that really talented team, they came up a little bit short in that game, but they were the only ones that really were up to the task of challenging Alabama. So this team, talk about LSU being three years removed from the national championship. Well, this team's only two years removed from having a legitimate all-time great team on the ropes. So when you look at all that and take that into consideration, I think the pressure on Billy Napier is actually a little bit higher than some people like to assume. There are already some rumblings about how he recruits and the type of player he recruits. So anytime you step into the hot seat at Florida. We've seen several coaches now fall by the wayside. Will Muschamp, 
Jim McElwain, now Dan Mullen. It felt like things were going great until they weren't. So right now, Billy Napier is hovering around a 6 out of 10. But if they lose to Utah week one, that's going to go to about a 9 out of 10. (laughs) So you lose to a Pac-12 team at home in your debut. That'll be a difficult thing, I think, for a lot of Gators fans to swallow. And whether it's fair or unfair, the expectation level at Florida is not that different from that of LSU. You're either in the national championship hunt or you're looking for a new job. So (laughs) it's fair or unfair. That's where it's at. But it's six out of 10 as we sit here at the end of July. But it can change quickly after week number one. All right, we're going to stay in the Sunshine State. And this one I'm very interested at because Mario Cristobal, he's got to get Miami back. And everybody who's been a head coach before him has brought Miami back. So what do you put Mario Cristobal's pressure at? I think he's obviously the, you know, their welcome home, the native son, right? So I actually think his pressure level right now is pretty low. But the problem is Miami wasn't that far away from being pretty solid last year. There's a team that won five of their past of their last six games, but they still felt like Manny Diaz wasn't taking the program to the heights that it needs to be at. So what do they do? They make a legitimate, they make a massive, massive hire in bringing Mario Cristobal down, but they've also now invested in not just the coach, but they've invested in the infrastructure. They went and got a new AD from Clemson and Dan Radakovich. They have really turned the corner down at Miami with what they feel like they're giving and what resources they're giving the program. So there will be no excuses, but he has some time. I think right now it's probably about a three out of 10, but if they aren't really making significant progress in the next year or two, that's when I could see that number starting to go up. But right now all is sunshine and rainbows at Miami because they feel like they have the right guy. I think they have a good team this year and will be highly competitive in the ACC Coastal. I'd actually be surprised if they're not in the mix. If I actually wouldn't be super surprised at all if they win the division. They're the favorite, according to many. So I think they bring back a lot, especially with Tyler Van Dyke at quarterback, especially with some of the pieces they bring back on the defense side of the football. But there's a lot of room to grow, but also we're talking about a program with an insanely high ceiling. So Mario has time. He's going to build it the right way. And I'd be surprised if they're not contending for championships sooner than later. All right, we're going to go up to Virginia now. I'm going to combine Virginia and Virginia Tech. Brent Pry, Tony Elliott at Virginia and Virginia Tech, respectively. What's their pressure? Well, I would say that Brent Pry, his pressure is quite a bit higher. Now, he's going to have some time. Um, He is obviously very, very appreciated by uh, the people at Virginia Tech. And he's taken over a program that got to the ACC title game in year number one of Justin Fuente, but then it just kind of lived in mediocrity. There were just too many inconsistent performances. A great example was the performance last year, week one, you go out, you dominate North Carolina, and then you fall flat at times too. I mean, there were just way too many inexcusable inexcusable roller coaster type of seasons under Justin Fuente's tenure. So I actually think Brent Fry, Brent Pry, excuse me, is in a really solid position where this program, yes, things have changed a little bit, but they're still a very proud program with access to great talent. Brent Pry knows how to create a defensive scheme that has had success there in the past. Of course, you remember the great defenses, the lunch pail defenses of Bud Foster. So I think they have the right guy in place to be able to kind of get back to what they did that made them successful for a generation and change under Frank Beamer and his staff. So I think Brent Pry's in a great spot. I'd have him probably around a four. Tony Elliott's probably around a one. Now he steps into a situation where they have good pieces He's obviously a tremendous offensive mind, has had ample opportunities to become a head coach for a long time. Everyone wants to talk about Brent Venables, and while he was patient, well, Tony Elliott was pretty patient as well. He hung around, waited, and a Power 5 opportunity presented itself at a program that has also had some ups and downs as well. But they bring back a quality quarterback. You know they're going to be able to put some points on the board, but the problem for Virginia over the last couple of years, they have been terrible defensively. They have to make some strides on that side of the ball. And of course, Tony Elliott being the expert that he is on the offensive side, what will he do to make sure that Virginia 
is not just good offensively, but also is taking into consideration their defense as well. They're not going to run a million plays. They're not going to go crazy tempo. They're not going to hang their defense out to dry. I'd be surprised if they did. So it'll be interesting to see the balance there, but I think he's on about the coolest seat possible because the expectations are not crazy high and he steps into a fairly good situation. All right, we're going to go all the way out west now to the Apple Cup. Washington and Washington State both bringing in two new coaches as well. <laughs> well, I mean, let's start with Washington State. I think they're in a great spot. Obviously, they went and they used NIL. One of the first guys to to kind of fall in line with the NIL world was the transfer quarterback who we referenced earlier in the show from Incarnate Word, Cameron Ward. The guy's got unbelievable potential. He also has three years of eligibility left. So, he, of course, is going to be a big part of whether or not Jake Dickert can get things going in the right direction. And honestly, when you look at Washington State last year, nobody expected them to do anything. With all the controversy and the things that have gone on, it's still a little bit mind-blowing to me that Washington State was able to have the year that they had. I don't think any of us, self-included, would have ever anticipated them being as successful as they were, given some of the challenges that went on with their previous head coach, but they found a way they played hard every week and they kind of carved out an identity of us against the world. So I think Jake Dickert's in a really good spot, a program with an established culture that will have a little bit of a difficult, difficult home field advantage for a lot of teams to go play in up there in Pullman. So um, the expectations are not high. So similar to that of, you know, a Tony Elliott, I would say his, his number's probably, what, two, three, maybe two? Let's say two. I just don't feel like he's going to be feeling uh, a whole lot of heat. As far as Kalen DeBoer, obviously he steps into a Washington program that has really underachieved. The good news is they have some good pieces to rely on. Regardless of which direction they go at quarterback, whether it's Dylan Morris or Sam Heward, they have good potential at that position. Both those guys have had bright flashes, even though Heward was kind of thrown into the mix in a difficult spot. Just last year, they have to replace just about everybody on defense, but that might not be the worst thing, given the fact that that group uh, had a fairly significant set of ups and downs. They were awful against the run, and that's part of what really needs to be improved. Is Washington, when you look back at the teams that have made the college football playoff under Coach P and what they did there under Pete Kwiatkowski, who's now the defensive coordinator at Texas, that front seven defensively was off the charts good, and they had really good players on the perimeter. Well, they got to start to identify some of those players, and I think they have some time. So I think Kalen DeBoer, much like Jake Dickert, much like Tony Elliott, he's not feeling the heat right now because the expectation level is not through the roof. He has time. So I would say he's probably sitting around a two, maybe even upwards of a three, because I do think Washington brings back a few more capable pieces because of how they've recruited than Washington State. So because within the state, they have slightly higher expectations, I'll put Kalen DeBoer at a three, and I'll put Dickert at Washington State at a two. Twos, threes. We got to rank it, ratchet up. There's here. no so pressure. Win, Obviously, right? you don't even have to win games anymore, I guess, in college football. You can just live all these 10 year contracts everyone's throwing around. You can just be there forever with me, just hover in mediocrity. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, they can't do that for USC. So, what's Lincoln Riley's right. pressure? I mean, that's you got to put that up there at like eight, nine, 10. Come on, what do you got? I think it's nine. I mean, if anyone is under more pressure than Brian Kelly, it's Lincoln Riley. And it's because of how, I mean, when you leave a great program like Lincoln Riley did and Brian Kelly did for another program that, you know, is expecting national championships, well, one, you're going to be compensated significantly, but also you're going to be expected to win and win now. And with how Lincoln Riley attacked the portal, I think the expectations for SC. I don't want to say they're unreachable or outrageous, but my goodness, they feel significant. I mean, I, I've seen people saying that SC is a playoff contender. And they might very well be. And if they do, man, give Caleb Williams the Heisman. I, I mean, that's fine. Like <laughs> He might very well you know, wave the magic wand. And next thing you know, this team's scoring 50-plus points a game, and nobody can touch them or keep up with them in the Pac-12. But, man, it feels like to me they still have a lot of unknowns on both sides of the line of scrimmage. And ultimately... This game, while it has become more about quarterback play, more about offensive firepower, more about if you have capable pieces on the outside to create big plays, the more likely you are to win games in those shootout type of environments. SC will be very uncomfortable in that spot. There's no denying that. But we're talking about a team that went 4-8 and eight last year. 
And for people now to have expectations, albeit outside expectations, but expectations of being at least a contender in the Pac-12, potentially winning the Pac-12, and potentially getting to the College 12 playoff, that seems a little aggressive. So I'd put it at nine. I think he's right alongside with Brian Kelly as the guy that's under the most pressure here in year number one. And like, we're going to set one more in the Pac-12. It's amazing, all these new coaches in the Pac-12. Right. Dan Lanning, Oregon. What's his pressure at? I actually think it's a little bit higher than some might suggest. Obviously, he did an amazing job at Georgia, uh, leading one of the best defenses in, gosh, college football history in today's era to give up that few yards and to give up that few points. You can make a case they're one of the best ever. And then you look at what they did in the draft. I mean, five first rounders, 15 players drafted on the team overall, but nine off the defense side of the football. Shoot, they had backup linebackers getting drafted in the third round. (laughs) What does that tell you? So I look at Dan Lanning, he's 36 years old, stepping into his first gig. And I think he's inherited a roster that should be ready to roll right now. I'm going to say that his pressure meter is around a seven because he inherits a job where they've already had and tasted success. They've already been to a Rose Bowl game. They've won a Rose Bowl. They've won Pac-12 titles. They've been to Pac-12 title games. Granted, I don't think the pressure is insanely high because I think there's such a wide gap between them and their roster and everybody else in the Pac-12 North. If they don't make the Pac-12 title game, though, this season would be a massive failure. So that means the pressure is amplified and couple that with the fact that you're playing your previous employer, the defending national champions in week one, say you get your doors blown off. What's that going to do for the narrative of Dan Lanning on a big spotlight there on ABC 330 at, you know, at 330 in the afternoon, like I said, in week one. So it's a huge spotlight. It's a huge first game. It's a huge opener. And you also had a team last year that was on the verge of a potential playoff berth had they played a little bit better and more consistently against Utah. So I look at this team and I think they're they're pretty good. I think they're pretty dangerous. I'm not sure they're quite to the caliber of what they were. I'm not sure they're quite to the caliber of being a playoff contender, but I do think nine wins as well within reason. And that should be the expectation for Florida, which obviously puts a little bit more pressure on the 36 year old head coach, Dan Lanning. All right, going from one defensive coordinator to another and probably the best hire in the off season. We're going to go to <laughs> South Bend, Indiana, Marcus Freeman. Where are you putting the pressure at for Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame? Uh, I, I think it's a 10. Um, and I think he has as much, if not more pressure than anybody else. And it's not because of anything that he can do. It's about the fact that his predecessor just left. By the way, he's in great standing. Everyone loves Marcus Freeman. But you are the head coach, your first head coaching job at a place that commands as many eyeballs as anybody in America. Um, every single misstep will be highlighted. Every single misstep will be criticized. Every single misstep will be overanalyzed. And when you're a first year head coach, you're going to potentially have a mistake or two, whether it's a clock management issue, whether it's playing the wrong guy, whether it's, you know, an issue when it comes to a challenge that shouldn't have been a challenge, or you didn't make the right adjustment a la what we saw from him in his first game as a head coach in the Fiesta Bowl where they didn't play very well in the second half of that football game and all of a sudden get beat in the second half by an offense that got hot in Oklahoma State. So I look at what Marcus Freeman is, and I think he's phenomenal. I just think the job is so hard, (laughs) especially knowing that Brian Kelly, albeit there's no love lost in South Bend for Brian Kelly with how he left the program. No denying that but that's a conversation for a different day. You cannot deny the fact that Brian Kelly was great for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. He was great. And Marcus Freeman is inheriting an amazing situation. He's already done an incredible job on the recruiting trail. Most publications already have them as the number one recruiting class in the country for 2023. That's a heck of a start. But if they go out and get blasted week one against Ohio State, all that goodwill could start to evaporate rather quickly if the team's not good on both sides of the ball. The good news is I think they're going to be pretty good. 
even if they lose week one, even if they lose badly in week one, they could rebound and still find their way into the New Year's Six with how the rest of the schedule all shakes out. So I think he's under a ton of pressure. I'd have it at a nine or a 10. Let's just say 10 to make it interesting. But ultimately, I think he's going to be crazy successful in South Bend and believe that he's the right man for the job. And quick bonus question. Who's got a tougher opening game? Dan Landing in Oregon traveling to Atlanta to play the defending national champs or Marcus Freeman in Notre Dame going to Columbus at night? Tougher game. They're both brutal. <laughs> I mean, uh, do you want to throw Utah in there too? Having to go to the swamp, um, even though we're not what talking about first year head coaches there. Yeah. But we got one on the other side in Billy Napier. So let's throw that one in. I think all three are awful. Uh, they're brutal road trips. They're very, very challenging. Obviously, the environment that Oregon will step into, even though it's a neutral site, will be very difficult. I think the toughest test will be for Marcus Freeman. Um, given some of the pieces that they lost in the back end, Kyle Hamilton being a great example of that. How are you going to cover C.J. Stroud? And how are you going to cover those wide receivers? Uh, because you hear about Ohio State, they get to the podium, they're like, yeah, we have receivers you don't even know about yet. They're like, oh boy. <laughs> well, the ones we know are pretty good. <laughs> all right, so tell me all you need to know. I think Dan Lanning's in a pretty good position because I don't feel like many people would give them an opportunity, so they're playing with house money. No one gave them a chance last year when they went to Columbus and you know, beat Ohio State there in week two. No one thought Oregon could do it. And sure enough, there they were. They go out and get it done. Um, And then finally, I think for Utah, I I think that they are in a really good position to be able to knock off a Florida team that will still probably be trying to find themselves. So any of those three games are all brutal, all pseudo road environments, even though one's a neutral site. But I would say in order of pressure, one is Marcus Freeman. That would be the toughest game. Two would be Dan Lanning going to Atlanta. That will be the second toughest game. Then three, I think Utah has a real chance of knocking off Florida in the swamp. Nice. And lastly for the coaches, what I think is the most intriguing one, Brent Venables coming into Oklahoma. What kind of pressure is he under? (laughs) Well, uh, this one, and and I hate to cop out, but can I say like one to 10? Because it could be either end of the spectrum. He goes out and they win eight this year. It's a 10. He goes out and they win 10 this year. It's a one. Even though 10 is subpar relative to Oklahoma standards, it won't matter because Oklahoma fans, I think, will be paying close attention to what Lincoln Riley does. And every time Lincoln Riley loses, they're going to throw a parade. So I think that right now, Brent Venables can walk on water in Norman, Oklahoma. They love him. Uh, I don't want to say he's the savior, but in a lot of ways, similar to that of Mario Cristobal, He's the chosen one. He's the guy that came back. He's the he's the son that is returning to bring Oklahoma football an edge, a toughness, and intensity to usher in a new era as they transition to the SEC. So I think he right now, day one at Oklahoma, probably sitting, all exaggerations aside, probably sitting at around a five. Where, because the expectation is still to be highly competitive in what I think is a very even field in the Big 12. I think there's five or six teams that could legitimately win the Big 12 this year. I really believe that. Oklahoma is definitely one of them. Uh, but I think some of the fans associated with Oklahoma, they actually think like they really improved at their head coaching spot. And I wouldn't go that far just yet. It's too early to tell. They might have. They, I'm not going to say they didn't. I'm just going to say I don't know. Right now, I don't know what kind of head coach Brent Venables is going to be. He could become the next Bob Stoops or he could become the next Will Muschamp. I really don't know. Both amazing defensive coordinators. One went on to win a national championship at Oklahoma. The other has had two power five jobs, neither of which went the way he wanted it to go after being the head coach in waiting at Texas. So I think it's a it's anybody's guess as to where it's going to go. But I feel very confident about the fit. I know the fan base in Oklahoma loves him. I know they'll be cheering for him every step of the way. Hey, thanks for being with us today. It was fun just being us, just talking ball. Coops and I just going back and forth, bouncing questions off each other and doing the pressure meter on coaches. Honestly, all these coaches, I feel like I'm really good spot. Am I crazy? Like if I am, hit me up in the comments. Hit us up via the email at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter at alwayscfb on Twitter and Instagram. So you can hit us up there. So we really appreciate you being with us. Hit me up at Greg McElroy. If you think I'm nuts, please tell me. We'll interact. Let's have a talk. Let's have a chat. Let's do it. I think all these coaches are great. I actually really like this group of first-year head coaches. I think a lot of them are going to be at their place 
for a very long time and bring a lot of success to their respective program here in the years to come. For all of us here at Always College Football, continue to like, rate, and subscribe. It helps out the show. We really, really appreciate it. For Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.